Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Stephanie D. Preston, whose latest work, The Altruistic Urge, Why We're Driven to Help Others, was published by Columbia University Press and was released just last month. Stephanie is a professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. Her work and publications revolve around the concepts of empathy, consumer behavior, environmentalism, as well as evolution, hoarding, and addiction, and of course, altruism. She co-edited the Interdisciplinary Science of Consumption, and in addition to those scholarly publications, her work has been featured in the Washington Post, New York Times, on the BBC, NPR, and a host of other periodicals. Um, altruism. It's sometimes defined as showing an unselfish concern for the welfare of others, like say working at a soup kitchen or volunteering time at a recycling center. And then some, sometimes it's like behavior that benefits another at a cost to oneself, like giving away your sandwich so your friend or stranger wouldn't be hungry. You know, the kind of person who would give you the shirt off his back, yeah. his or her. And then sometimes it describes the hero who, as we feel that we're that kind of person that would jump onto a railroad track, described in the book, to toss a little girl to safety while risking probable or even certain death. And sometimes, and this is really what drives the book and makes the reader think, is that there's a kind of linchpin to this work, which is the manner in which a dam retrieves her pups. These are rats we're talking about. And I also learned that a group of rats is referred to as a mischief. Which I didn't <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you two examples of my altruism. One is Muriel. So 1974, I think the same day that Nixon resigned, August 8th. So I was clerking at the law office of John Trabascus and I was coming back from the courthouse and I saw this little old lady and I, I could see she was having trouble crossing the street. And I just went over and helped her cross the street. Didn't think about, it was an urge. And maybe we can talk about the difference between an urge and an impulse. And I thought, I didn't think, oh, what a cool guy I am. But I went back to the office and Muriel, who was Muriel Jackson, then she got married to this guy named Ziegenfuss. So her name changed from Jackson, which was a nice name to Muriel Ziegenfuss, which I tend to go uh, segue aside to nothing. But in any event, when I got back, she said, oh, you're lovely. I wish there were more people. In the and then all of a sudden I thought, wow, I'm so cool. I'm a great guy. And uh, Stephanie goes into that too. So, I mean, oh, and the second was yesterday. So I was back at my old house and the greenhouse was like really hot. So I turned on both fans and the humidifier. And then I was leaving and I was backing out and I saw Wren that was coming with food to feed her babies that were inside the fan. Oh. And she was trying to be altruistic, but like Stephanie says, sometimes you think when you're in a foreign country and you see somebody, maybe you can't help because you're not sure whether, you know, whether you're going to help or you're going to get hurt. Anyway, so the, the Wren was deciding, should I rip myself apart? And then so I just, I don't even know if I thought, I just, I, I, I got to help. So I ran back at the expense of my plants and turned off the fan and checked to see that the nest was in front of the fan. So they were okay. So I turned off the fan, but I never thought of it being altruistic. I just did it. Nice. So with that, welcome, Stephanie, and thanks for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, these so are those, such, go ahead. I was going to say, are those both acts of altruism? And how do they relate, which is important in this book, to a mom rat bringing her kid back to the nest, or for that matter, her friend's kid? Right. Because it's different. It's a different yeah, thing. I think they, they have differences, but there's a clear commonality. And what we talk about in the book and in my class is that one of the primary commonalities is vulnerability, right? So your brain is wired to perceive and be um, activated by vulnerability in another individual and to be very astute at quickly calculating what you think their level of capability versus vulnerability is. And this evolved, I believe, from the mother offspring bond where, you know, especially altricial animals like humans, but also other mammals, 
they need a way to make sure they care for their offspring, which are going to be helpless and vulnerable for a period of time after birth, humans being the most altricial because, you know, it takes years, if not decades, for your kids to fledge the nest, as it were, and uh, at great expense, and they're vulnerable in so many ways, you know, and um, so we have this kind of innate almost capacity, and uh, we can talk later if you want about the word innate, we just discuss it in the book and what it means, but um, capacity to perceive and respond quickly to vulnerability. So an older person is vulnerable because their, you know, motor system is impaired, they can't move as quickly, you know, they can't cross the street in a timely manner in case a car comes or, you know, the curb is sometimes treacherous for an older person. Um, so, you know, you quickly perceive that and you and you went to act and you didn't have to sit around a lot and have a philosophical conversation with yourself about if you valued the person and what you would get out of it and whatnot. And the, the good feeling you had after economists like um, Andrioni call the warm glow of giving, right? So you feel good because you gave, but that's also part of the neural system, right? So your brain evolved this really adaptive and facilitative response where not only do you have this like urge toward vulnerability, you know, it's like almost is physically propelling you toward this case, but in the canonical case of like a helpless infant or pup, you pull it back from danger and then there's this close contact, right? So in the nest, in a human baby, you know, with pups um, that are rodents, once you pull the pup or the infant back from danger, you have this close contact, which also evolved to be rewarding, right? To feel good, to you know, give you all the warm feels that you know, close contact give you. And so I believe the warm glow of giving is like an extension of that. So you gave, you pulled somebody back from danger and you felt good afterward. And, and humans can have some little extra pizzazz on top of that original mechanism, like sitting around and thinking how good you are and how you're going to tell the story later and how your friends will approve of you and this person might pay you back, you know, but that doesn't mean all of those things were the cause or the initial reason you did it. And so in case of the wrens, it's similar, right? Those, the bird and especially the eggs, if they were uh, eggs in a nest or vulnerable, like they they couldn't stop the fan without you. You know, she couldn't retrieve her offspring without your help, without your intervention. And like a rush to turn off the fan is kind of like this propelling urge to help. And then, you know, you can feel good afterwards. So, so many people want to argue about, oh, is it altruistic if I felt good, if I got a reward, if somebody saw me, you know, that there's endless debate about this and the many, many kinds of rewards you can get from giving, including just feeling good. And does it count as altruism if you feel good? And I say, absolutely, yes, because that's how your brain evolved. And it's a good thing. And we're so thankful we have it, right? If we didn't have this mechanism, you know, we wouldn't be social aggregating creatures who could like benefit from um, a group social life. So I think, yeah, there's rewards and we shouldn't denigrate them. You know, like they're an awesome component of this very efficient neural design. Well, you live, if you live in, in a brain for good or for bad, a mind like mine where you're constantly resonating and it takes up all your time. You know, first I didn't think about it. Then I thought, well, I had a friend in the car too. So he thought what a nice thing I had done. Then I thought what a nice thing I had done. And then I thought, oh, you, it, why are you complimenting yourself on doing something that's right? And then, you know, and then it goes back and forth and it's like a bell. Right. And, and that's a, you know, human consciousness. So you, I know you talk a lot about consciousness in your podcast. It adds that layer of, you know, rumination and self-congratulation. And we actually talk about this self-congratulation a few times in the book, but um, that doesn't mean what you did is bad or wrong or to be regretted or, you know, not to be shared with others because if we find it normative to be helpful, you know, by praising it when it happens, talking about, you know, these kinds of events, it just promotes it all the more by priming people that it's normative and gets over things like bystander apathy. The thing that's cool about the book, one of the many things is that 
and I say this in a lot of the interviews too, is that like you're talking about endless debate, if this book is in our book, our nonfiction book club, which it will be, it's like, there are going to be people that say, no, it's like this. No, it's like this. And that's the, that's when you know it's a good book because you don't want everyone just <laughs> ducklings. You want, yeah. you want people to disagree. You want them to disagree. And the that's other thing about your book, which is good, is because there's kind of like humor in it because, and I want you to explain the entire rat experiment because you really do bring it back throughout the book. But the funny thing is how you talk about the shoot where they put the babies down is like a theme park, like a water right. slide. Right. So why don't you describe the entire experiment? Yeah. So um, a while back, I was um, preparing an article about altruism and these neural mechanisms. And Stephanie Brown, who's also a social um, scientist, pointed me to the work of Michael Newman. And he's a, a contemporary neuroscientist who studies this brain mechanism for retrieving pups in rodents and rodent models. So he's mapped out the circuitry of this through these experiments. And after reading his work, I was kind of inspired by it. I was like, that sounds a lot like a heroic rescue, you know, and it has all these features in common with what I already think about altruism. So let's go read some more about it, right? And so I read a whole bunch of articles about that topic. And one of the first ones was by this guy named Wilson Croft. And he had, and the graduate students aren't authors on the paper, I don't think, <laughs> but the students in the lab were um, supposed to take the pups from dams, which are, you know, rat mothers who have just given birth, and they each create a litter, and they put them in a chamber that has two sides, like there's a nest chamber, and then there's a, um, like a conditioning chamber. And so just like you imagine, you know, Skinnerian conditioning experiments, the rat would push the bar. And in the first trial, maybe some food came out, you know, push the bar. After a few trials, her own pup would come out and then push the bar. And then thereafter for three hours, it's not her pups. It's the pups of the other dams who had given birth around the same time. So they put one of these pups in a chute and it traverses down the chute into the conditioning chamber where it's like alone and helpless. And that's not its mother, but there's no reason for the rat to care if it's genetic re related. It has these hormones and these brain systems that are all primed and activated to care for pups. And so she puts the pup in her mouth, carries it over to the nest chamber, and then returns to the conditioning chamber just to see what's next, you know, and then push the bar another little helpless pup comes down the chute and she traverses with it in her mouth to the nest and comes back and they did it for three hours and this literally says in the article that the experimenters you know got tired and so they ended the experiment and decided that the dams were not going to habituate to this and just stop doing it you know like a lot of conditioning is about how long will you persist before you give up you know without the rewards and so it's like an awesome study because, you know, it's hilarious to imagine this like conveyor belt of pups going down chutes and then what they do because there's a limited number of pups, they kept taking them out of the nest and then returning it to the top of the chute, you know, so these pups are making this little trip every few minutes. And um, so it's really like funny just to imagine. And I really like how in older scientific articles, they add details that, you know, wouldn't be allowed in current you know, science writing, like the experimenters got tired and gave up, you know, like if you said that in an article now, they'd be like, well, we can't publish that, you know, like, and, um, but also it has um, all of these features that are interesting about altruism, where like the vulnerabilities involved, mother offspring, um, neural mechanisms and hormones are involved, you know, this caregiving and this effort, and this like kind of heroic rescue of um, an individual from danger back to safety. And the fact that it was so, you know, irrepressible, I think, is how it, to me, achieved this sense of urge, you know, like an urge that, you know, you just want to quench as long as you can, as long as you have the capacity. Yeah, I started thinking about maybe someone could do an experiment about when experimenters habituate to their own experiment and leave because they want to go. 
<laughs> yeah, and then you know you you have a recursive effect there and keep studying it one level further up. But like, <laughs> they the, get tired um, too. <laughs> but it is true. Like you have to wonder. I, you know, as a lover of animals and nature and animal behavior, I don't love animal research, but I, I approve of it for the reasons you know that it's valued. But you know, the fact that we they put in little details in this articles about like no pups were harmed during the making of this experiment right and you don't have to say that unless we care about what happens to these pups and they're right. not humans but we still care about well were they harmed like are they okay like were you mistreating them you know like people wouldn't you know have to explain that they didn't harm any animals unless we had this like inherent caring of their well-being yeah and then also you also say to me hey you know the reason why we study rats and mice it's not just for fun they are like us mm -hmm. you know and the reason we study them and decide about new drugs because of that or decide or actually decide whether their behavior is similar to ours and why what was interesting about this maybe i'm wrong but it seemed like you described the plasticity of the brain in the sense that where that nurturing impulse resides has changed it doesn't reside in the same place. But then I was thinking, she's wrong about that. It has to reside in the same place all the time. <laughs> I don't think I said it doesn't reside in the same place. Like I do believe this same neural circuit that's described for the rodents is subserving our own human avoidance versus approach of people in need. Um, you know, humans have a lot of extra layering where you know, you might be able to strategically decide to help somebody without this urge, or you might combine some stratagem with, you know, like an urge, which is pretty common, but people aren't consciously aware of the part that's an urge. They're only consciously aware of like, you know, the tape playing in their head that is consciously accessible. So people overweight that component, I believe, compared to like this evolved, very powerful hard to um, restrict mechanism. And going along with that is, you know, when you talk about Nicholas Tinberg and Tinbergen, is it Tinbergen? Tinbergen, uh-huh. Yeah, when you talk yeah. about Tin and, you know, this idea of mechanisms of a adaptive value, ontogeny and phylogeny, and then I go down my rabbit holes where Stephen Jay Gould's book, and then I ordered his book, which I didn't uh. need to spend money because it's out of print. Because <laughs> um, I love him. But then, you know, I hate the idea that ontogeny phylogeny is discredited because I kind of like it. It seems elegant. They have gill slits and prehensile tails and stuff. Yeah, but I mean, that stuff is so important and so underappreciated. My um, graduate advisor was an expert in sort of brain evolution and phylogeny. And so, you know, she made us sign up for these classes where we had to learn all about it and memorize these, you know, trees and I'm so grateful to that because I have a lot more knowledge about which features are shared across species. And some of them go back to teleost fish, you know, like they told me to take out the word teleost in the book because it sounded too technical, but I think it's awesome. And I think, you know, knowing these things places humans into a context that's, um, you know, resonant with the rest of the world and the rest of the environment, whereas this belief that humans are special and dominant and at the top of a hierarchy that, you know, evolved to some point of um, greatness is mistaken and it leads to us doing a lot of things that are damaging to the environment and to other animals and people. It's funny going talking about trees at the end of the book, you almost sound wistful because you're talking about, hey, we don't know this stuff yet. And maybe these trees go on to other. So what were you thinking when you wrote that? It's like, we don't know yet, but maybe this goes further back. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, I think people find my claims that people are similar to other mammals and rodents, at least on some of these levels, to be, um, you know, like too crazy. <laughs> And so I don't want to sound too crazy, but I know a lot about this component of the phylogenetic tree. And so I'm going to restrict it for now to the part that I do know a lot about. Um, I know Lisa Feldman Barrett was saying something similar, like scientists and authors have to be careful not to extend past their expertise. Um, 
but especially where consciousness has evolved, right? Like everybody wants to talk about how consciousness evolved and people have like really no idea. And so, and so I think there's like caution is necessary. And so, you know, maybe in some other book, I'll be able to say, well, what does this ant rescue response in ants that looks almost exactly like this pup retrieval, you know, does it share any neural homologous features with, you know, pup retrieval in rodents or in other species? Maybe, you know, like it does actually have like a pretty compelling neural case um, because like E.O. Wilson was writing about how an, when ant um, frees another ant that got trapped, let's say, by some object over its body, then um, this hormone gets released that's like a stress hormone. And it's not the exact same hormone as like cortisol, but, um, you know, they're, they're similar chemo structures and there's scent involved, just like there's scent involved when your dog gets really stressed out. And so, um, you know, humans contagiously catch the stress of other humans. We've demonstrated that in the lab with cortisol and with the sympathetic nervous system. So I don't think it's like impossible that, you know, there are other parts of the phylogenetic tree that share some of these attributes. I just, I don't feel like we have enough information at this point for me to go around making um, prognostications, but, um, you know, I think it's certainly interesting to follow up on. And um, I hope somebody will be looking into this, the people who do the ant research. Like, um, I think Noak is one of the authors. Mm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's like, that leads me into when you, it's not like you make fun of it, but you go, oh, it's like the trope, nature versus nurture. And I remember when I went to this, I, I didn't get into any colleges. So I had to apply to this college clearinghouse. And I finally got into this I'm Jewish and I got into this college run by nuns. So oh, it was the first year it was co-ed, Loretto Heights College in Denver. So it was interesting for me. Wow. I had a great time. Sister Mary, Mary Louise really took a liking to me and took me oh. on a trip. So she taught wow. science fiction. But anyway, so sorry, I did that's it again. Awesome. No, that's an awesome backstory to where you are now, like at the top of the intellectual ladder, you know? Well, I would tell there is you. one if there is one <laughs> the first it was so experimental a college that the first year all your classes were devoted to nature versus nurture huh. everything huh. and when you when you say when you kind of make light of it is you go hey it's it's both it's it's pretty right. obvious just both which right. is what I concluded after this study and that leads me back to okay it's both and that's promulgated and your rats and in us, depending on the kind of parents you have and how they treat you. But it's like, okay, you I mean, oh, show your show the book, the title, uh, the, the cover. Oh, yeah. So I think it has sort of like the heroic boat rescue theme on the front. And then, you know, it's nice that you do that because plus there's a lot of slack in the rope, which is good because you can throw it a long way. You, have a, <laughs> you can help somebody at any so distance. But the thing about it is, I, you know, I, I'm thinking the altruistic urge throughout the book, but then I keep thinking like what I did yesterday. And the other kind of trope is that I had this impulse and you think, do you think I'm going to move? Do you think this is a thought come? I'm going to move my arm or do you move your arm? And then you have the thought I'm going to move my arm and something else is moving your arm. So then I thought, what's the difference between an urge and an impulse? Does, uh -huh. an, impulse, does an impulse require thought first? And does the urge, does, does the rat do this thinking, if it can, I'm going to do this, or does it just do it like I kind of did with the wren? I would not assume there's any concurrent, explicit, subjective thought in the matter in people or rats. Like, I think you can discuss and justify your actions after the fact, and you might have some little pieces of conscious thought that you know, intermix in your head while you're doing this act, but those are millisecond level, um, you know, glimpses of thoughts. And um, I do, so I don't think that there's a lot of this conscious awareness that needs to be involved in either species. So like a lot of people go around saying, you know, humans have this special consciousness and I, my, my emphasis is almost like the converse. It's like, yeah, yeah, about your consciousness, but like there is a lot of work being done below the hood of consciousness. And we have to understand and appreciate that. 
I think you was it was it Chalmers you were talking to about how like you can only use your own brain to study your brain, right? Like, is that an effective approach? And I've always thought of that. You have a broken a hammer and you fix it with right. a hammer. You can't fix your tool with a tool that's broken. Just, right. And so and then, if, you, you know, I go use, if you use like your American mind to imagine how people evolve or how their brains develop, then, you know, you have this like natural tendency to categorize things, you know, like black and white, like cats and dogs, you know, like from birth, you're perceiving the world and developing these concepts and categories. And they're very helpful to us. But that doesn't mean like literally nature always has these sharp divisions and that they're like physical boxes that separate them, right? And so our minds appreciate things categorically. So it's it, it's just easier and more sensible to say nature and nurture as like two boxes and you can be a one, but you can't be in the other at the same time. But that's not how reality works. And there's so much awesome work on epigenetics and even in this rat model, like they have this neural system and they have pups raised by mothers who either are giving them a lot of stimulation and grooming and petting and warm contact or not so much. And their brains develop totally differently. You know, like your stress response is changed by the way in which you um, develop during this early period where you needed this close contact and soothing um stimulation so you know your your genes themselves are changing through these behaviors that you know are being enacted every day but like are especially powerful in this early period well if you drill down on that to the <clears throat> the other aspect of altruism which is heroism which is really interesting it's like okay so the guy or you or i we see the girl on the tracks we just jump we just jump and toss her away. And then the train is coming at us and we try to get out of the way whether we can or not, but drill that down. Okay, trace that back. So there's no, th I'm thinking there's no thought, you just do it. But then who's doing it? You, are you doing it? Uh -huh. Well, it just depends your definition of you. Like if you is your brain and your mind and your ability to like make neural calculations, it's you, right? But if it's like this, like homunculus mini me that's like in my mind that I'm, you know, hyper aware of that doesn't need to be involved, right? But it's still you. It's just like a different version of you that um, is real and exists and, you know, has a lot of influence. My, my emphasis is on like the way your perceptual and motor systems evolve to make very quick calculations about things. So like your motor system, especially in cases of you know, like urgent action can make very fast, very accurate predictions about how its motion is going to impact the world and whether it's going to be successful or unsuccessful. Is it near or far? Can I reach it? Can I not reach it? Right? Can I climb this step or not climb this step? Like you can intuitively and implicitly make those calculations. And so you won't jump onto that train track if you feel like you've calculated in your motor system implicitly that you can't physically get there in time and out before the train comes, or you are not strong enough to lift the individual and pull them back out. Like your brain can make those calculations without the secondary you that you're talking about being involved. And people, I think, underappreciate the role of like your awesome you know, evolved motor system that we also share with these other species in so many regards. Yeah, it's like when you think about all the near misses you've had in car accidents, like the car's coming right at you, you know, thinking you just, like you said, all these calculations and then you swerve and swerve back to yeah. either miss the dog or make, you want to miss the tree. And then afterwards you go, how the hell did I do that? Yeah, and you can like bust into a sweat and your cortisol clearly got activated, right? Your amygdala definitely fired, you know, and you might be shaking a little bit from this arousal. Um, that's a real, that's real. That's your, your body evolved to make these kinds of decisions long before it evolved to sit around and, you know, contemplate the earth or the navel. So um, an interesting example is... <laughs> Like similar to what you're saying, there's a statistic where they say you shouldn't try to swerve to avoid a deer. You should just 
go at the deer because people who get in accidents with deers are the ones who swerve and hit a tree or go into the ditch or hit another car or something like that. And I'm like, well, that's an impossible statistic because you don't know how many times you swerved and succeeded because you don't you don't report that to the insurance company, right? Like they don't have any data on that. So you should go around telling people to ram right into deer. You should let your brain do what it's pretty good at doing 90% of the time. And that goes back to Stephen Jay Gould. He was at a lecture and talking, you know, some born again Christian was saying, well, I was lying in bed the other day. You know, she didn't believe in evolution. I was lying in bed the other day and I thought to myself, the FedEx man is going to knock at the door in the next five seconds. And he did. <laughs> and he's going, how many times did you think that? And he didn't. Right, right, right. Yeah, you can't ignore the base rate in statistics. <laughs> Which reminds me of something else I thought, like there was this New Yorker cartoon where the dog and cat are by the front door and the guy opens the door and the dog goes, where were you? I was worried about you. And the cat's going, the cat's going food. <laughs> so I was thinking, our cats, <laughs> I don't think cats are altruistic. I don't think they give a crap. But the negative would succeed the, I mean, are there animals are there any animals that aren't altruistic? Are there any exceptions to the rule? I mean, I think there's like a systematic alignment between the ecosystem and social structure and mating system you're in and the kind of altruism you're going to observe, right? Like cats aren't particularly social, at least like the domesticated kind that live in our house, right? Like lions have prides, but you know, the feral cats are often wandering around alone and they do take care of their offspring. You know, they're not just like wandering off. So that technically yeah. in biology is a form of altruism because they did something to benefit the kitten that wasn't directly for themselves. Although we know now from Trivers and Hamilton that it does benefit our genes in the long run, but that was technically classified as altruism before Trivers and Hamilton. You know, why do we do this? Why do we take care of our young? And then they said, oh, because of, because of genes, you know, but um, they're, they're all species who don't take care of their young, you know, where they like put the eggs somewhere, they deposit the eggs and then swim away or, you know, crawl away. And you're not expecting a whole or lot. Eat them. Or yeah. Eat them. Yeah. Well, all species will, will probably eat their young. I, I don't, we, we <laughs> that's not special. <laughs> we don't do it very often as humans, but um, all over the animal kingdom, under the right conditions, the young are a viable source of protein. And you can always make another one, I think, that biology tells you. But, um, you know, you're, it you're depends on the on, You're treading on thin ice right here. <laughs> I know. You have to... <laughs> <laughs> but that's biology. Like, I think people get upset about biology because they're like, well, no. that doesn't sound nice. And you're like, well, biology doesn't need to be nice. Like, it, that's not one of the attributes that's important in this case. Well, so when you're taught, when you talk about nurturing, it reminds me, and this is totally off base, but you dedicate this to Brent. Brent's your husband? Yes. And then I started, you wrote, you wrote a paper with him, right? Uh-huh. We went okay, to graduate so, school together. Yeah. So then I see these Stansfields everywhere in your book. And I'm going, who are the Stansfields? So he's a Stansfield. And then the Madonna and Child, which is like so cool because it's basically, oh, there's great illustrations in the book and an incredible number of footnotes. But <laughs> the thing about the Madonna and Child is it's non-representational, really. It's two ovals and an arm that cradles. And that's it. But it gives you such... I, I took a picture of it and it's now my screensaver on this thing. Oh, really? Yeah, because yeah. it's such a cool picture. But yeah, we have color versions of it. If you want the color version, it was Brent's grandmother was a painter. And so she painted all kinds of paintings and some of them we own, but that's one that we have in our home. And you're right, like because of this like canonical posture of the mom and the baby, you could recognize it with very few details, right? Like your brain can top down what is that and what is the meaning of it and why does it feel wonderful even to look at it, you know, because of this like importance of that phenomenon in our lives. Yeah, I did an experiment. I zoomed in completely on it 
with my <laughs> iPhone. And it was actually very almost pointillistic because each of the it strokes. Is. Yeah. And right. so then I zoomed out until I got to the point where I could actually establish in my mind that this is nice. This is a nice thing she's doing. Uh -uh. You can just like, as soon as you see that, the tip, the very bit of that arm, yeah, you just know exactly what it is. And it seems like the nicest thing in the world. I think you know? it was Gibson maybe who called it direct perception. You know, like you don't need to wonder and think about it. It's like the warmth of the act and the meaning of it is like immediately available in your mind from the perception, you know? Yeah. William Saroyan said that beauty is anything looked at with particularity. And I've done that too. Like if you're driving down the road, you stop at a red light and you look in the median, and there's a piece of glass. Mm. And if you just concentrate on the piece of glass, you realize this is beautiful. And it's, it's very interesting. It was like the last MRI with, um, with Tom Cruise at the very end where the guy, he's, his friend, he's been searching for the perfect cherry blossom, the most beautiful one. And then as he's dying, he looks at him and he goes, they're all beautiful. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I where, think. Where the hell am I going with this? Uh, you're trying to sell your book. There, there's um, beauty in nature and, and in biology and whether or not we think it all sounds wonderful and complimentary, there's beauty in the fact that this system evolved without us being there to engineer it um, from the top down. Like it, it happened spontaneously through this process of evolution in a way that's so effective and powerful um, to me, that's like awesome and beautiful. And humans don't have to be only giving and not at all selfish in order for it still to be a beautiful thing that needs to be appreciated. There's another aspect of this, and I have no idea whether this is altruism or not, but it's something I do. So at the bookstore, if on the front mat, someone's dropped, I don't know, a piece of paper or a cup with water rice in it or something like that I always pick it up because my father always said if you don't pick it up nobody will huh. and if I don't pick it up it just stays there right so wherever <laughs> I go on the street if I see something like that I pick it up and put it in the trash can that's not altruism but what is it it is you're you're contributing to the public good you know and that's a form of altruism we, we did a study in my class last semester just a few weeks ago um, there's these kinds of studies called the glove dropping studies where, you know, some experimenter pretends to be a normal person in a public place and drops a glove and then they measure if anyone picks it up for them and does it matter if it's a girl or a boy doesn't matter if they're in a park or a city does it you know so there's like all these variations on this one phenomenon, which I think is so interesting and and it it includes all these attributes of the altruistic urge, right? So like if I see a mom in a stroller and the baby's shoe falls off or they throw their hat off, which they want to do, you know, I'm like, go get it, go help them, you know, because babies are so cute and you want to help them and moms are so stressed out and you feel bad for them, you know? And so like the urge is so potentiated in that case. But then we tried to think of cases where you wouldn't so care so much. And, you know, when there's a lot of effort involved or you feel threatened because it's like late at night and you're a woman and it's a man and you don't want to, you know, interact or, you know, it's a really rich person and you're like, they're not vulnerable, you know, like they could just buy another one of those, you know, like, why should I put in the effort? Or I find that person intimidating. A lot of women in my class said that they might not act if it was a male because they felt unsafe which I, I hadn't appreciated the degree to which they're worrying about that. Um, but, but all of these attributes of like when you act and when you don't are because of the way this altruistic urge evolved to like be activated by vulnerable, helpless individuals in immediate need who require aid that you know you possess, that you predict a successful outcome, like your motor system, you know, your mind can predict whether you think it will work out. Actually, that reminds me of the two stories you tell, which were instructive. The one, your first trip to Europe without your parents, and two, your mother. And then, yeah, you, when you gave, tell those stories. I, I'm, why should I tell them? <laughs> well, one of them might be what you're talking about is um, when I went to New York City, I was like 17. Oh, New York City, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and I was on some kind of like summer trip up to, um, I think I was going to Maine, you know, to the National Park in Maine. And I 
passed through New York City and visited some of my parents' friends there. And, you know, it's a little overwhelming to like drive into New York City for the first time. And I parked and immediately after parking, a man came up to me with this very long convoluted quickly spoken story about his troubles and why he had this urgent problem and it wasn't his fault, you know, and the situation was just, you know, out of control. And he was, you know, it was, it was befallen upon him, not something he sought out the trouble. And I, I really was drawn in by this story and he was so good. And I gave him $20, you know, and like I was 17 and this was 19, you know, like 95 or something. And a whopping, a whopping $20 is a lot of money. And it just flew out of my wallet into this man's hands. And as soon as he was like, oh, thank you. And then he walked away. And as soon as he walked away, I was like, oh, I think I just got duped. <laughs> you know, like I'm clearly a tourist. I believed his story. I didn't, you know, even though I was a little thrown by the way he's speaking too fast and seemed, you know, like perhaps under some influence, you know, it didn't, it, it couldn't fight against this urge to help him based on the way he told this tragic story. And um, so I, so I don't do that anymore. Like I give dollars and you try to help people, but you're not like so easily dissuaded. I but I, I'd rather go through life trusting everyone than go through life not trusting anybody still. Right, right. Yeah. And, and the obverse of that story is when you, you were abroad and you saw the two people arguing. Oh, so right. I was in China. We, um, I went with two of my children to teach a class in China for the summer in Shanghai. And we, you know, they have the most awesome public transportation in that city. And I think they built it in like a record number of years. <laughs> it was a, it's a, amazing. And so we, we take the subway and the buses everywhere. And um, we were in the subway one time and it was pouring rain because it's kind of like a monsoon season when we first got there. So everyone was kind of hiding inside the entrance to the subway, you know, like where the stairs are going down, but protected from the rain. And there was a Chinese couple there that was arguing and it was pretty intense. Like it was an intensity of an argument that I almost have never seen in public, you know, like probably happens in people's homes, but people don't fight at that level in public, which was alarming to me. And, you know, like I fear for women's safety as a woman and, you know, I'm concerned about domestic abuse. So I, I was vigilant and watching and he's being a little pushy and too aggressive but I, I didn't feel comfortable going up to them and saying anything, you know, like if I had felt really in control of the situation and I understood the cultural dynamics of the place where I was, and I didn't feel like maybe the aggressor could turn on me, I could go up to them and say, Hey, is everything okay here? You know, like, um, it seems like things are a little heated, you know, and try and get it ameliorated. But because I was so uncertain and a little worried about what might happen to me if I got involved because people don't always like, you know, the, the interloper. And so I just kind of like cautiously watched from a distance until it seemed like it simmered down and then I left. But I, you know, like when, when you know you were the bystander and you had apathy, there's some guilt that goes along with it. But, you know, I, I do think it's like adaptive to have this you know, neural circuit of avoidance in cases where you sense danger or you don't feel capable. Yeah, um, we adopted two of my daughters from China, which I guess is altruistic and um, <laughs> theoretically. And anyway, so when it was over there, I would see two people arguing vociferously really, really loud. And it took me a while to realize this is just the way they were yeah. best friends and this is the way right. it's loud and it's fast and they just right. right. And I realized this is just cultural and but yeah I think it's important to appreciate those cultural differences and when you're in your own culture you feel more confident that you understand what's going on right I, I used to have a um boyfriend Filippo Arelli is also a primatologist who's now married um to a wonderful person but um, in Italy, he and his brother were fighting on the sidewalk. And after the fight stopped, you know, I said, is everything okay? Like if that happened in my family, you know, we might not speak to each other for 10 years, <laughs> the level of that conflict. And he's like, yeah, we are just trying to decide what restaurant to go to. Like, it's <laughs> no big deal. What are you, what are you worried about? You know? 
Um, so yeah, yeah. It, it is important that, you know, when you say it's an altruistic urge, people think you're saying all nature, no nurture, right? Like it's always going to be the same. And they say, what about culture? You know, and like, because your brain is plastic, because of, you know, the effects of learning on your brain, it differs by culture. It differs, you know, depending on how you grew up and where you were raised. And that's expected. That's part of the neural mechanism. Well, to play devil's advocate, even though you kind of say no, when I was reading the begin, especially the beginning part of the book, I'm thinking she thinks it's all hardwired. Right. I honestly did. Yeah. No, I know. That's why, like, I, I don't know if you read the chapter about like, what does it mean to be hardwired or what does it mean to be an instinct, you know? And so I try to explain, even though you hear that word, it doesn't mean fixed. It doesn't mean every time it doesn't mean immutable. Right. So people's understanding of the word isn't biological. It's like that categorical kind that, you know, oversimplifies the case. And I, so rather than write the book about all of these neurons and the different dopamine receptors and things that are in the science article, I felt like I had to devote a lot of the book to the detractors, you know, like people who would just say, well, this is ridiculous, right? We don't have anything in common with rats. I'm not so subject to urges, you know, <laughs> like I'm a very rational, conscious human being who makes decisions wisely. Like, don't, don't tell me about this. You are obviously wrong. And um, so I did try to like emphasize that, but you, you kind of would have to read the whole book to like, to get the memo, which um, might not happen if someone just kind of like took yeah. a glance. Yeah, I liked the book, so I read it. You, <laughs> I mean, Thank that's you. That's the whole idea, right? <laughs> right, right. That's Why would you... I not read it? Here's, you... a one, here's a one off. So if I'm pronouncing it right, is it neotenous or uh -huh. neotenous? Yeah. So yeah. this thing about neotenous. So then I went down the rabbit hole again, which I hate that expression, but it's true. So then I realized all these models and these young girls who are 14, they get on the cover of Vogue and um, after YouTube videos of people trying to show you how to look more like a child. Yeah. What's the deal with that? Well, because we evolved to, you know, be attracted to these infant like creatures that's something Conrad Lorenz originally described. And there's an image in the book that's of his drawing. And we evolved to find that compelling and attractive, right? And, and wonderful. And so it happens to activate this kind of sense and appreciation even outside of the context of an infant, right? So they even have dozens of studies where they take pictures of adults and the ones that naturally look more neotenous or that they alter to be more neotenous, like with bigger eyes and shorter noses and rounder heads, people say they're more beautiful, they're more attractive, they look nicer, you know, I'd rather give that person money, I'm going to return their wallet. Like there's all these studies uh, specifically on the way this impacts our behavior. We have an article on that that's not published yet, but you know, there's dozens and not hundreds of examples of the way this impacts our behavior outside of the context of infants. And that's okay, you know, like it's okay. But there's also like studies showing there is a there is a division between like pretty and beautiful and cute and attractive, right? Like your minds can dissociate those and you would hope adults are more pretty and attractive or whatever and, and more young people are cute. Um, but it, it doesn't, it just doesn't always work out that way. And, and sometimes leads to, you know, very unfortunate consequences. Right. Well, genetically, and you go into this, and this is kind of a cancel culture thing is, you know, you go into the idea of men seeking out and women sneaking out partners who, who they believe will strengthen the genetic pool. Um, mm -hmm. You're looking for someone with lustrous hair or right. lips or whatever. And that goes back to the hard wiring. And, I still think a component of our daily lives is that, you know, you see, this is, you can't say this, but you see a really pretty girl while you're walking down the street and your head just immediately swivels to look back. Right. I mean, like the, like the, the old meme. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to appreciate that that's a real thing and you don't have complete control over it. And it, it, it influences society in so many ways like there are studies showing that politicians are systematically taller than the average person yeah so like this person who has 
height and then and people are selecting for height as like something they'd rather have in their gene pool right um and you just attribute prowess to them or you know like dominance which sounds like a good attribute in a leader and there's no other reason why you should expect a tall person to be a great mayor or you know politician congressperson even their name if their name is you know if it was Ziegenfuss, you might not vote for the person or yeah. if it's you know whatever jackson jackson mm -hmm. yeah same thing oh and the other cool thing is that which seems totally counterintuitive is the happy person sad person and who you help oh right yeah, that was another study that started as a class project. Like, right, we had the class project of the glove dropping study. And then a bunch of years ago, we had a class project on the door holding study. So it just started out as, you know, in theory, people who are empathic want to help distressed others, right? right. But that, so that is like the common wisdom in social psychology and in a little bit of evolutionary psychology. And, but there's primatologists saying you want to help the individual who can benefit you, right? So you want to affiliate with the ones who are doing well. And so you might help somebody who's doing well, more, not like as an explicit reciprocity, but they did like a study with monkeys where one monkey started out as a subordinate and nobody wanted to be friends with this subordinate monkey who you know wasn't very popular and strong but then they gave only the subordinate access to know how to open this box that had food in it so no one else knew how to get the food except for the subordinate individual and the friendships flourished you know like <laughs> suddenly it was very popular monkey um so in that sense there's a conflict in theories right you help distressed helpless you know, individuals who aren't doing well versus you help those who are doing well, who might seem successful and happy and popular or, or capable. And so we wanted to pit them against each other. So we had people walk behind you into a public building, pretending to talk on the phone and sounding very sad or sounding very happy or neutral, but saying more or less a similar thing. And people wanted to help the happy person more, you know, which does make sense in that evolutionary context. You know, you want to affiliate with happy people. They make you feel happier. They might energize you. You know, there's so many reasons why that sounds like a good idea. And then we thought, oh, well, undergrads maybe aren't sympathetic characters, you know, like maybe undergrads seeming sad is like not something to really sympathize with. It's not like a helpless, vulnerable baby. So let's do it at the hospital. At the hospital, somebody who's really upset could be going through something terrible, you know? And um, the division was worse. People wanted to help the sad person even less at the hospital. And we haven't done follow-up studies, but it, it might be because of the potential for disease, you know, um, interaction or how busy the doctors are. We, we, we didn't control for a lot of things. But then we did another study with videos of hospital patients who are happy or sad. We did multiple of these studies. And um, people did feel the most empathy for the saddest character. But the happy person doesn't seem as in need, but we give them aid. You know, we still give them help, even though they don't really seem as in need as the sad person. And if you have to sit with the person and spend time with them in a way where their emotion can impact your emotion, people want to help the happy person. But they feel more sorry for the sad person and they feel they need more help, but they'd rather give them money and not have to like be near them. You know, so there's subtleties that make sense, but that, you know, you have to go beyond like the caricatures and understand like context. So here in the Northeast in Philadelphia and around, there's this Uber convenience store called Wawa. Oh yeah. And, and um, so there's, Wawa has created so many profit centers and I go there every day, even though I don't need anything, you just, you go there, but they have double doors, double entry doors, which they don't need to have. And the reason they have them, they even design the buildings this way is because you're always either opening the door for someone or someone is opening the door for you and huh. it's two doors. And so when you go in, you feel happy as a human being, either because you're a good human being or they're a good human being. And huh. that way you want to consume more. Oh my goodness. 
That's so interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that that was an attribute. But one thing that was funny in our study is, you know, like the canonical case where the man holds the door open, you know, and ushers the person through ahead of him. Um, that is very rare and more common in men than women. And a lot of people do this thing that's sort of like a fake altruism where they like shove the door a little bit and then let go and keep going but like not in any way that helps the person because this little extra shove isn't going to hold the door open long enough to help the other person but people still go through the theater of like i recognize that i probably should have held the door for you but i actually also want to get to class yeah this one you're semi forced to do it but it really does work and you go, oh, you always go like, well, guys, because it's usually subcontractors and people like that that are going there to get a sandwich or coffee. Yeah. You go, Thanks, man. Thanks, bro. Yeah. And, and but it is a little awkward because you open the first door and you thank them, and then they open the second door, and you don't want to thank them twice. Right. So somewhat awkward. <laughs> I don't think they took that into account. No, uh, but it, it it really does work. Um so what was the other oh there was something else that i was really interested in asking what was it um but you can tell i read the book right yeah. oh, i know what it was here's how you can know i read the book because and here's the <laughs> the anti-altruism so okay. you got this big gorilla or maybe I, I think it's maybe not a gorilla but okay he's the dominant one uh. and he moves the subservient one out of the space where he's sitting even though he doesn't really want to sit in that space oh right he just goes yeah. like basically F you and just right, you know. right. Yeah. So talk well, that, about that. So what does that have to do with altruism? Why do you shove it in the book? <laughs> right. So um, the reason I put that in the book is because it evokes this understanding of the commonality across species. Like when the bully in the romantic comedy, you know, forces the nerd to get out of his spot in the cafeteria or, you know, like pushes him out of the way and takes a seat and whatnot. It, it looks exactly the same. These were rhesus macaques that I was talking about, but yeah, right. they, um, it looks exactly the same. The dominant just walks up and kind of like stares at the subordinate who is like, oh geez, and then walks away and then he sits in that exact spot. But they're, you know, they'll do it no matter where that subordinate is sitting. It doesn't have to be a great place. It's a, it's a way to enforce the dominance hierarchy. And macaques are known to be a little more despotic. So like this hierarchy is much more linear and serious whereas like you know in other species maybe humans like in bonobos or something they're less despotic and so you know i might help you but you help somebody above me you know like so there's these trans intransitivities um but yeah so that's just part of like how we maintain this social structure right and dominance is a real thing in humans too like these women who don't want to pick up the glove of a man at night in the dark you know there's there's threat from people you feel are stronger more powerful from than you you know you wouldn't like a really good case is these days are you going to be an ally all right let's say you're at a meeting and somebody who's the dominant your boss says something inappropriate to or in the presence of a person of color let's say People feel uncomfortable. They wish it hadn't happened. They are so resistant to say something in the moment or say something directly to the boss because that person has power over them. You know, it's the same, it's a hierarchy. And you don't want to buck the hierarchy because it could, you know, impede your own life and success. So we had these conversations at work, as everyone's been having during Black Lives Matter. Like, how can we improve this? And by and large, everybody favors the approach where later you go and talk to the victim and say, are you okay? Would you like me to do something to help? And people are not really favoring the option where you would say something in the moment. I try to, and I use humor <laughs> humor to, you know, like lighten the mood, but you, you don't always, when this hierarchy is, is strong, people will stay quiet. There's bystander apathy. Yes strange thing happened to me at the bookstore to us at the bookstore is I put a Black Lives Matter sign up in the window mm. and then it was always anonymous I got voicemail I received letters mm. that you know we were we always come to your bookstore and we were looking for we were looking forward to buying some books today but then we saw the sign in your window and we will never come back to your bookstore again mm. and 
the one letter was really good. The first person I see every morning is black. And I'm going, yeah, because he probably is your <laughs> driver. I don't know. But, you know, and I wrote, I wrote a letter back to him. I said, you know, thank you for writing a letter and express, you know, because I appreciate the fact that he actually wrote a letter explaining his position. Huh. You know, that it was. Well, anti- that's like the trope of, you know, my best friend is black, so I can't be a yeah. racist. And you're like, well, that, and, that doesn't excuse you from all the behavior. But that's a cultural phenomenon, too. You have this position. You don't necessarily need to convey it to somebody else. There's no reason for them to tell me. And it's always anonymous. Right. Which goes the, it goes to the other side of altruism, like that Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Ted Danson notes a wing. He donates a wing to a, a building, and he says anonymous. And then oh. Larry does one that's anonymous, but then Ted Danson tells everybody it's him. Right, and right. These, these people are chasing Larry and he runs, his, the door is locked to his building and he goes, I'm anonymous, I'm anonymous. <laughs> no yeah, people denigrate those cases and we use it in class as like a classic example of like the selfish altruist who's just trying to like benefit themselves and their reputation in a way that's like culturally appropriate. But um, it's still kind of a good thing that we have this mechanism where being perceived as giving is a valued trait. Because if it wasn't, there would be no need to um, for people to know you donated a hospital wing, right? Yeah, but I mean, would you want to have a stadium named after you? (laughs) I I I personally wouldn't. (laughs) There's too many concussions happening inside there. But, um, you know, if I had so much money, it might, it might offset the guilt of like having more money than any human should have, I suppose. I don't know. Because that's an altruistic emotion too, right? If you feel guilty that you have more, it's because inherently behind that thought is we should all have, you know, similar amounts. When they, when you check out of a, a store and they say, would you like to donate a dollar to do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about this in class where um, it depends where you are, right? So like if I'm in a place that feels very anonymous and I am in a hurry and it's just a machine checking me out, not a person, you know, I, I can often push no. And then later I'm like, why did I say no? It was like 40 cents. Like you're such a jerk. But then like, if, if you're at Whole Foods, there's a human staring at you who, you know, must have good values because they work at Whole Foods, you know, and then I can't say no in that context. I always say yes. And even at CVS where it's a control condition, right? right? Because normally I check out at the pharmacy or the drugstore on a computer. Nobody knows. So I say no, but I really like the pharmacist and He's a really nice, helpful guy. And so when he asked me if I was going to round up, I was like, oh, yes, I I will (laughs) ring up, right? So like you care about what people think about you and we value as a culture, at least, um, being a good person. And that wouldn't be the case unless we evolved this kind of like need to cohere and help and affiliate. Well, thank you for listening to my podcast. But if you know me from my podcast in this interview, if they ask me at Whole Foods, do I want to donate? I go, no. <laughs> and if anyone ever pushes me, I said, no, I'll give to who I want to give. I'm not giving to you. I'll decide who I'm going to give. <laughs> For me, against the altruistic urge model, it's kind of like your brain can calculate costs and benefits immediately. It doesn't have to like make it explicit. It doesn't need a spreadsheet. It doesn't need a list. You know, like your brain can immediately transpose the cost and the benefits and come out with a decision. And you know, 40 cents. I'm like, yeah, what's it to me? You know, it's no cost to me to a billionaire, a hospital wing, $200 million. What's it to me? You know, it's just crumbs, but, um, you know, at Panera, they changed the tipping option where the default is $2. I'm like, so the default is for me to tip $2 on like a $2 cup of coffee. Like that seems a little steep, you know? And so, Two dollars isn't going to like kill me, but I still like kind of resent where we crossed over the threshold between the cost and the benefits. Yeah, my brother and I went to Subway and he goes, well, you know, you need to you need to leave. You can leave a tip on there. And I go, why would I leave a tip? They're making me a sandwich. That's what they're supposed to do. There's no <laughs> tip. Well, unfortunately, we have to tip because some selfish billionaires are not paying their workers enough and they yeah, don't have a living wage. It's like we're we're actually compensating for the people who are benefiting from their, you know, cheap labor. Well, so 
to stop our rambling. <laughs> so, uh, to, so to conclude, the one thing we didn't talk about, which is really interesting, is kind of like the hero thing. Like the right. guy who saved the kid, all of a sudden, he didn't really want, he just did it. And then he right. gets $10,000, basically like the key to the cities on every TV show in the world. Yeah. But what, who is, it's like Joseph Campbell's uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh -huh. it's like, so what makes a hero and is an heroic act, an act of altruism, you have a good Venn diagram too. There's always a Venn diagram. But, right. But so where does the hero fit in the Venn diagram? It doesn't seem like he really fits in there. Well, the hero is a kind of altruism. And to me, it's actually like the prototype of the pup retrieval. Like that's why the pup retrieval is so interesting to me because only it's in heroism do you literally, heroic. what's that? That's heroic to you? Yeah, because like, well, I mean, not the pups per se, but like the human act is exactly um, like the act of retrieving a pup and pulling it back into the nest, right? And um, so to me, it's almost like that's the prototype of the behavior that we evolved and we get to enact it in different situations because of the way the brain, um, you know, uses this mechanism. But that's almost like the primary case of altruism. If you think about the way people evolve to care for offspring in this way and keep them safe from danger. So um, that's how I see it. And, and heroism is like, you know, it's kind of like when they say, um, it's like you you have the prepared mind, right? And so it's not actually like magical or like inconceivable. It's it's very predictable from the attributes of the observer. Do their does their brain calculate immediately that they can succeed? And people who are stronger, faster, who've tried things like this before, who are practiced at it, you know, who know how to swim, who can carry somebody out from a fire, you know, those are the people who rush in because their brains calculate they can do it. So they're not really rushing into a situation that's terrifying in the same way it would be terrifying to me. Like, I can't jump into a train track. I, I, I don't think I could succeed. We just, there'd be two people dead instead of one. So, um, you know, he judged the situation very quickly because he said of his work experience in confined spaces um, that he could predict that they would fit under the train. And he was right by half an inch. And then the hero oftentimes becomes a leader. Like John F. Kennedy, they pushed the PT-109 story or, or Eisenhower or Grant. You know, you be, you're a hero either in war or some other valorous act, and then you become a leader because right, right. people find Yeah, because strength. you have strength, you know, you have strength and conviction and you're willing to sacrifice yourself for others. So those are things we value the same way we value a dominance hierarchy and we value caregiving, right? And if you right, can right. combine those attributes of being strong and powerful and competent and warm, wow, you've really, you know, like hit the jackpot. Yeah, so you have to be like the dominant macaque, but with a heart. Right, right. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good place to end. So uh, let me do my let me do my Terry Gross thing. Okay. We've been talking to <laughs> we've been talking today to Stephanie D. Preston, whose latest work is the altruistic urge: why we're driven to help others. As I said, it was released last month. It's in our bookstore, and as I always say, which is true, it'll be on our front table. And thanks so much for being here. Oh, are you, are you, what's your next thing? Like a mystery or a thriller or a science fiction? <laughs> well, you mentioned at the very beginning consumption and hoarding and things of that nature. And those are also behaviors I have studied in rodents. So I think the next one focuses on that angle of my research. Okay, more rats. So we'll have more rats. Kangaroo rats this time. Oh, cool. Squirrels, squirrels, kangaroo rats, people who hoard. Oh, Bank accounts. My, my my dog is a squirrelophobe, but it's driving him nuts. He's like running around and he's like whining and he's so obsessed with squirrels. I feel like he needs therapy of some it, kind. It is quite a problem, especially now all the baby squirrels were just born in springtime and they're like proliferating. <laughs> all right, I thought I ended it and now I'm doing it. This is, this is what I do. It's like- 
Oh, I, I really appreciate it. I think you, you do an awesome job and it's like a service to everyone that we can learn about these books and figure out, you know, what we're going to read. And I think it's awesome. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. And, and maybe someday you can come by the bookstore too. Oh, I would love to. Have okay. a great day. You too. See ya. Bye.